you are at E Hour, um, and I am not Eric. <laughs> so my name is Christine Gordon, and I am filling in for Eric Bozinski today. Um, behind the scenes, we have discovered that I cannot drive uh, what's happening in class today. So uh, I am greatly relying on our fabulous production team to make that happen. So thank you, um, Nick, you're, you're a voice in a vacuum for most of us, but thank you for driving my autonomous car. <laughs> Um, I want to welcome everyone to 407. We're really excited. Greg Gage is here. He'll be on camera here shortly. Um, but before we go to Greg, Eric has left me um, a few housekeeping items to share with you. So Nick, if you could put up Eric's slide entitled housekeeping, that would be great. Um, and that housekeeping item, um, I'm looking at my notes from Eric. So I have to, I'm looking at another screen right now. So um, he wanted the entire class to know, uh, be reminded that submission one is due on Monday. Um, that is the mentorship network question. He said, while most students have turned theirs in already and they've done an outstanding job, um, can keep, keep them coming for those who haven't. But uh, the theme is described in the course syllabus and it, on Canvas. So get those questions in by the due date Monday night. Um, Eric also wanted to send his apologies for not being here um, I, I used to teach 407. This is such a charge. I mean, this is this is how Eric and I recharge on Fridays, being able to teach classes. Um, so Eric, sorry, he cannot be here today. He will be back next Friday. Um, because he's not here, he cannot share the poll results from last week's poll. So he will do that next Friday. Wanted to assure you about that. Um, we also had a student organization up round submit um, a request for an announcement. Um, they would like the 407 audience to be aware of their organization. Nick, I, we, are we on slide three for up round? Yes, it's up. Okay, awesome. Um, so you all can see their full four bullet points they shared there. Um, and then their contact information, um, upround.vc for more information. Um, but without further ado, I want to get to the main attraction, um, and that is uh, Dr. Greg Gage. Um, Nick, if you would go over to his um, headshot while I, Eric, prepared a wonderful bio. Um, Greg, I don't want to off the cuff this, though, because uh, you, you deserve a lot of accolades. Um, I want to make sure the students know uh, that uh, while you started out at Michigan State <laughs> earning your BS, um, and then you pivoted over to the University of South Carolina for your MS in computer engineering. You ended up um, with some really good friends of ours here at Michigan in the biomedical engineering uh, department, and that's where you earned your PhD. Um, some backstory for Greg, I believe he was a lab mate of a couple people on the CFE team. Um, and Greg, I will share anecdotally, I always loved when you would come up and meet Matt and Harak for lunch because they were just giddy um, to see you when, when you guys would have your lunches. So. Um, we're, we're glad you're going to be back on stage with us today, and, and a hello from Harak and Matt. Um, but for the students in this group, uh, Dr. Gage is the co-founder and CEO of Backyard Brains, which is an Ann Arbor-based company um, that you started as a neuroscience grad student um, while at the University of Michigan. Uh, Backyard Brains produces open source uh, DIY neuroscience tools, uh, which are appropriate, appropriate for the benchtop of both research and instructional teaching labs. Uh, this company won a U.S. Small Business Administration Award just this month um, for accomplishments in creating cutting-edge technologies. Um, you are a well-published neuroscientist and engineer who develops tools, curriculum, and experience for the general public. Um, you're part of the Molecular and Integrative uh, Physiology Department. Um, and uh, on a national scale, we, uh, we want to acknowledge that Dr. Gage is uh, an award-winning investigator with the National Institute of Health a senior fellow at TED, and a recipient of the White House Champion of Change Award from President, uh, former President Barack Obama for your commitment to citizen science. Um, you are pro prolific. I mean, you've had nine TED Talks online, one of which uh, has been viewed, what, 9.3 million times, um, demonstrating how to control someone's arm with your brain. Um, and more recently, you've done a live demo um, hashtag X STEM talk with uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci and Dr. Francis Collins, um, the NHF, NIH director. Um, I, Greg, you're incredible. Uh, you're also the father of two daughters. Um, so you're a parent too. You get 
how important uh, science education is in the uh, K-12 curriculum. And without further ado, um, I wanna throw it over to Greg. But Greg, that means you're driving with Nick's help. <laughs> okay, so if I can become, I think I, I'm, I'm enough in COVID to understand that I need to be a presenter in order to be able to share my screen. Is it, could I do that? Let's see here. I am now a co-host. That's you are that. A co -host. Yeah, I'm not even hip enough to know the the term co-host is what I wanted. Okay. You are hip, Greg. I am going to share my screen here. Okay, okay. we're going to give you a round of applause while you're doing that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for the for the invite. This is my second time uh, being able to speak uh, to the entrepreneurship group on E Hour, and so it's it's exciting. It's a different format this time. I'm going to be doing it virtually, but hopefully, uh, we will you'll be able to understand. I think mine is not so much. It's it's almost like a a cautionary tale of what could have gone wrong, and and also a kind of a, a hopeful tale that uh, if we can do it, pretty much anyone <laughs> anyone can do it. Um, and so with this, uh, so in this new round, I think I gave a talk maybe like three or four years ago, um, but they'd asked me to kind of organize it around the, the CFE mantra. And so I'm gonna, I've, I've attempted to, to do that today. And so I'm gonna uh, talk about how, kind of the journey. Uh, and since I I'm much like you, I, I was a student um, and was interested in entrepreneurship. Uh, I'm gonna talk about kind of a little bit of our journey and then and then touch on those four points that we that we brought up and so uh, that's where I'm going to start so my journey started as a neuroscientist um, I, I did work in biomedical engineering but I, I moved to uh, central campus where I was actually doing research on the basal ganglia with rats and this type of stuff and it was around this time we were wondering you know about this idea that uh, why is it that I had to wait uh, to get to grad school in order to get this expensive equipment right so I had to dedicate my life you know, spend, you know, six years slogging away at a professor's lab, just get access to his expensive tools, right? And, and that was a shame because, you know, 20% or yeah, about 20 percent of the world, uh, one out of five people has a neurologic disorder. And how many cures do we have? We have none, right? And so why is it that the tools that could have unlocked the brain, you have to get a PhD to do it? And so, um, you know, we looked at in other areas of science, for example, in astronomy, you don't have to get an, a PhD in astrophysics to look through a telescope. You know, a kid can go get a cheap telescope, you know, learn about the heavens, maybe become interested in becoming a scientist, maybe interested in becoming a, um, an astronomer. But the point was he didn't have to dedicate his life or her life to do this in order to get access to the tools. And so we thought about this around the time. And in grad school, we did a whole bunch of programs with kids and trying to get them interested in the brain and try and but we noticed that everything we were doing was kind of meta. It was kind of like kind of science, neuroscience, but wasn't really because what I was doing in the lab was really cool. I was recording from brains trying to understand how like neurons drive behaviors. And then in here, I was doing stuff with like, you know, strings and you know bowls of ice cream, just trying to do analogies that didn't quite hit the mark. And so um, this is the try. So we just attempted to uh, replicate about forty thousand dollars worth worth of equipment, uh, with a budget of about a hundred bucks, and so uh, we, as scientists, uh, published a abstract in a, in a, uh, a technical uh, conference called Society for Neuroscience. It's about thirty thousand neuroscientists show up once a year, and we we put an abstract together. And you write the abstract right around now. I think it's due in like March. Um, but the conference isn't until October, November, and so in the abstract we said, you know, we're going to attempt to record from the brain for less than a hundred bucks, um, you know, stop by our poster and see how we did. All right, that was the kind of the idea. It's the beginning of the maker revolution where you know people were think, thinking about you can do things instead of just talk about things, right? So, and if you were to stop by our poster in that year, you would have saw uh, a bunch of you know prototypes with wing nuts and balsa wood. And uh, so there's much younger version of my co-founder, Tim, and I, he was my lab mate in grad school. Um, he was also pictured in that cartoon. I should have pointed out him out at that time as well. Yeah, so the, uh, and so the idea was that we were gonna record the spike for uh, $100 and it turns out that it worked and we were able to do that. And so uh, much to our surprise, uh, we were just kind of doing to be hipsters. Like you just want to show, show off that like, you know, you know, cause I was working in a lab where electrodes cost $1,000 a piece and we can, 
our, our electrodes, you can get a thousand for a dollar. They were sewing pins. And so we thought that was kind of cool. Uh, but the, to our surprise, it got picked up by the journal Nature and we were on the Nature podcast. And I started getting all these emails from people like, oh man, that's that project you do is super cool. Never mind all the high profile neuroscience papers I was doing. No one cares about that, right? So it's a stupid side project. I was getting all this, this kind of uh, positive feedback on. Uh, and so at some point we realized, well, hmm, you know, maybe this side project could be the real deal, right? And so this is um, where we talked to the Center for Entrepreneurship and we, we did our very first grant um, and we, it was called the $100 Spike. We didn't know what to call ourselves at that time. And so we, were, uh, we, won, we won an award. It was like $500. Oh, I didn't know what to do with that money. So we, we hadn't bought more parts to build more of these kits. Um, and then we, we won some pitch competitions. We went out to the Silicon Valley and we're showing them our, our, our cockroach brain recording devices. And they said, nah, no, we don't want that. So that's all right. So they, um, so then we came back and we worked with the center for entrepreneurship and we were in the incubator, uh, for, for, for U of M. And we really started thinking about, well, what can we do then to really start this company to make it real? Right. And so, um, it was around this time that uh, there was a Kaufman Foundation that allowed us to do a postdoc where Tim, my co-founder, was able to uh, start for one year paid by the Kaufman Foundation to really think about how could we turn this into a real company, right? And so um, and around that time, we got our first TV gig. We were on PBS NewsHour stop by and we got to be uh, in, on, on national TV. And that gave us a little bit of accolades that we could then use to kind of like give us a little bit more um, clout when we were uh, writing these, these kind of business application grants and, and some other type of grants. But we ended up um, deciding at some point that we were going to do this, you know? So like at that point, I, I was just finishing my PhD. This was a year later and I had to decide, do I want to break away from academia, the thing that I was kind of focused on for the last six or seven years, uh, or do I want to start a company? And so that's where I decided with Tim that I was going to start a company. So I was going to, you know, forget everything I did in grad school and focus on this really weird side project that I had. And so we founded Backyard Brains back in 2009, uh, and we went to work. So we got to start building a whole bunch of copies. We got our, our first order came from the University of Michigan as well. So someone in the psychiatry department was doing a class and he ordered, I think uh, 30 of the kits and we were like blown away by that. And so we, we got that money and we bought more parts with that and started, and then we made a website and then people, and our very first order came the next day from someone from UCSD, another uh, team, actually there were, were grad students like us formally, but they were trying to support us. And so, yeah, that's how we got started. So it was very, very slow. Um, and so we were in our, in my apartment, cutting wood, <laughs> like sawing, doing all this type of stuff, trying to get our, our first prototypes up and running. And then our first opportunity came to us. We won a grant, um, uh, for a startup grant this is right, right at the, at the kind of the beginning of that whole, whole idea of, uh, these, these startup incubators that were popping up around the world. So we moved down to South America with startup Chile. And we got $40,000 to stay there for a year. Uh, and then we re up for another year. Um, so we, we, we had a little bit more money so that we could start paying for ourselves, paying for some equipment, uh, and then was able to kind of take off from there. And so uh, we had our very first conference the very next year. So that's the same conference where we did our thing as Society for Neuroscience. And so we were, we were getting going. So we had um, our prototype one, which is on the left, which is our very first product that we did uh, for that poster. Over that course of that year, we did a lot of work on that. We, we had to figure out how to productize that. So we did that. And what we ended up with was like a device that you could hold in your hand that replicated everything that you find on a, on a laptop or a, a bench top uh, bench, a big rack of equipment. So it's an amplifier that allows you to record from the brain and then put it into the palm of your hand, right? So that was the idea. You can use the student cell phones to be able to, to do neuroscience. And so um, I, I'm gonna give you a, big, a quick background. I feel uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't discuss neuroscience as a neuroscientist to an audience. So I will tell you really quickly that your brain uh, is made out of about a hundred billion neurons, maybe it's 80 billion. And someone corrected me after a talk once and said they counted it. So you know, I'll give them credit, give her credit. Uh, and so these neurons look like any other cell, but they have a really strange little process. A process is something that's going from the center, we call that in science, and that's called an axon. 
And you might be familiar with this if you're familiar with deep neural networks, it's based off that same philosophy, right? And so uh, these neurons will reach out and they touch another neuron and get really close and that's called the synapse. And they use something called electricity uh, to communicate. So why electricity? Because it's very fast. You wanna be able to jump away from a moving car because you don't want chemicals too slow, right? So you have to be very, very quick. And that comes in the form of a very specific message called a spike. And it's through that spike that everything that you've ever, ever known in your life, your, you know, the smell of your grandmother's basement, your favorite tiger, the, all these things are represented by these neural firings inside your brain in a process called consciousness, which we don't quite understand how that works yet, but um, represented using sodium potassium, just regular stuff you drink through Gatorade, pumping through these, these neurons at very fast rates, up to 500 times per second. And that is what gives you uh, who you are, right? All these memories are stored inside the synapses, we think. That's one of the, the leading hypotheses right now. And that the spiking rate is indicative of something that's happening in your behavior. And so I just want to do a quick demonstration because I feel like, you know, I'm going to show you now how the brain can communicate through the body. And then we're going to listen to a very simple experiment. So I'm going to take a some uh, sticky gel and put it on my arm right here. And on the other end of the sticky gel of the sticker, there's a little piece of metal. And if you know about uh, electricity a little bit, you know that electricity likes to run through metal. And so what I can do is just clip some wires onto my skin here. And so the electricity is going to flow from my brain down my arm when I command it to move. It's going to come, the electricity is going to go through this little sticker with some, you know, salt water gel on there, connecting to the metal here. And if I turn this on. Okay, Greg, I'm gonna interrupt right now. I wanna make sure everyone can see what you're doing because <laughs> I okay. can only see the woman cut away. Oh, yeah, okay. Here, let me do it this way though. You know, I have thought about this people. This is not my first rodeo. So I'm going yeah. to, yeah, I forgot. Yeah, I was, uh, no, that's Oh, look me. at you, there we go, okay. There we go. So now, can everyone see this? I put some stickers on here. So these are the metal stickers, or these are, and then on the back side, there's some salt water. And so right now when my, my brain is gonna send a message down, the electrical message down to my body here, our little device here is gonna pick it up and amplify it. So, so as I move my arm, you're starting to hear this type of stuff, right? But we are, we are careful scientists. We don't just wanna hear things, we wanna quantify it. So we've developed a suite of tools that you're gonna be able to on your you know, laptop or on your, um, on your phone, we're going to be able to see it as well. So this is how we quantify data. So we can do this within schools. So we can put this here. I mean, how I get rid of this thing. All right, there we go. So now as I move my hand, we can start to see the electrical activity from my brain being amplified by here, right? So this has got a bit interesting. So now we can see how uh, you can start to use this to do stuff. Because here's my brain moving something and I'm seeing it on the computer. So now what would happen then instead of using just the the signal, oops, I want to leave this on. I want to then hook it up to something else. I'm going to say, what would happen if we stuck that into a computer that could do something a little bit more interesting? Right? So here's an Arduino, and I can stick it into here for a very quick demonstration. And what it will show you is that now, as I move my hand, if you can see this here, as I move my hand, I can get these LEDs to light up. This is like the hello world of physical computing. And that's kind of interesting because now we can do something with that once you get into a computer. And then what we're working on with students is to figure out some creative things you can do. So here's something that a student developed, which I'll show you. And this is a brain machine interface that's very simple. So I put my hand down and I squeeze it up, down, up, down. So these are just controlling a one dimensional servo and you can already get students that can really understand how you can do interesting stuff with the brain. So that's kind of a cool little demonstration of kind of what neuroscience can do to technology to kind of get students sort of interested in what's going to happen into the future. All right. So there we are. Um, and so now I'm going to go on to talk about the, the another kind of bizarre project that we worked on next. And this is called the Robo Roach. Uh, and so this is the world's first commercially available cyborg in the history of mankind. Uh, and so how it works is that the uh, inside of the uh, cockroaches antennas, there are a bunch of those, these guys right here called neurons. And those neurons are sending information back to the brain. And so what you can do is you can look at um, 
the behavior of the cockroach. So if you're if you are touching a cockroach or blowing on one of its antennas, the cockroach will turn in the opposite direction. It's called contralateral turning. Um, and so what you can do then is you can stick a small wire inside the antenna of the cockroach and tickle it a little bit with electricity, just like we saw on the screen, that electricity that I was showing you on the screen. We can feed it backwards, right? So you can feed the electricity into the neurons and get those neurons to fire. And if you do that, uh, you might be able to create the behavior as if it was feeling something or seeing something. So this is what it looks like. You put the antennas back into a um, uh, 0 0.1 inch header that you find on Arduino. So you can see it right here. It's a little header there. And these two holes go to wires inside the antenna. And so if you pair it to your backpack, you can place your backpack inside of there and your backpack has a Bluetooth adapter on there and Bluetooth low energy. Then you pair it to your phone. And then what you can do is take your cockroach out for a walk. Uh, and so I can show you here. I'm not sure if this will show up. Yeah, I can stop it if it doesn't work. But this is a demonstration of how you can connect to your cockroach and using uh, just Bluetooth low energy, communicate directly with neurons inside the cockroach and get it to move. So right now, he is going to the left because I'm touching its, uh, its he's, yeah, he's going to the right because I'm touching his left antenna. But then you can take him out for the walk. I can touch his right antenna, he turns left. I can touch his left antenna, he turns right. And so this is uh, how you can make a cyborg and this came out we did a kickstarter back in 2013 uh and i think we had more not even like we had more shares on the kickstarter than we actually made dollars like i think it was shared something like twenty thousand times um and we made like thirteen thousand dollars on it so it wasn't really extremely commercially popular uh but it was a cultural phenomenon at the time and so uh, I just want to talk about, so what, what did we do with this, uh, this, these, this company that we built? So we've published uh, probably, I haven't counted a while, but it's over a dozen, I think about 15 peer reviewed papers right now, uh, looking at our gear that it can be used and how it can be used within education. Uh, we've had over a hundred peer reviewed papers that, have, that are using our stuff in schools and in, in, in universities around the world. Uh, as you mentioned, we did, um, we have five uh, live main stage TED Talks based on this technology. And we had a show with TED called DIY Neuroscience. It was filmed here in Ann Arbor. Uh, and we worked with students to kind of come up with really creative ways to use our technology and kind of explain how the brain works. Uh, we brought home the hardware. We won the, we went to the, go to the White House and uh, uh, we won uh, at the Society for Neuroscience. We won awards at the NIH. You know, we've been on TV, you know, probably about once or twice a year on Netflix. Uh, we've been on uh, with The Rock and Kevin Hart and uh, with Mythbusters and Bill Nye, all these kind of fun stuff. And so that's kind of the, the positive aspects of, of what we did. But here comes the fail, right? So we had we had so long to get our act together, right? But uh, we are kind of, because I have that research focus, I'm always kind of writing grants. And so I've been able to sustain the company so far uh, by uh, supplementing our income with grants. And I've, I've plotted here, this is, this is uh, we're open source finance. So you can go to our finance.backyardbrains.com and every month you can see how we're doing. And for some reason we had a dip here in 2020 second quarter. I'm not sure what happened there, but the, but the idea is that our, our trend is kind of going flat, but we're gonna hopefully bring it back up because here's the big bomb. If I went and I plotted back, I calculated how much we spent last year. That's our burn rate. And if you can see, there's this area of white between our burn rate and our actual sales. And so that's where we're failing. And so we need to somehow close that gap in order to be a successful company and not just be kind of relying on, on grants for the rest of our lives. And so uh, that's where we're gonna do the dues, right? Um, so how are we gonna get around that, we think? We think we're going to, we have a contract right now with uh, Penguin Books and MIT Press to develop a, a book. And the book is going to be a popular book about all of the experiments we've done. It's called How the Brain Works. And it's gonna be about um, you know, doing what I've done right now so that you can learn everything from neuropharmacology to brain machine interfaces from, you know, what you name it about how the brain works from sensory motor processing uh, in simple experiments that can be done at home. And now uh, this week we're preparing uh, a different book proposal for NSTA Press. Our, our goal is to get into 
uh, the classroom. And so we, we have two versions of our book. We have one that's for the general public, and this more in a popular style. And this is in more of a teacher style that has the stuff that's needed for the classrooms, right? So with those two things, and then probably this thing that, which I heard of, you guys may have heard of it called marketing, <laughs> which we haven't really done that successfully yet. Uh, so we started to this last month uh, we actually have call to actions on our website, but we definitely need help with that. So this is kind of a, a pitch for you guys. If you guys think you can help us uh, figure out a way to do uh, targeted ads and figure out who our clients are a little bit better, we, we could definitely use the help on that because that's kind of where we are uh, failing as a company is sort of becoming kind of a success on our own. So we don't have to rely on these um, these federal grants and state grants. And so. Uh, and, in closing of this quick kind of recap, these are um, just some of the, the things that we've done as a company so far. We've raised over $5.2 million um, from various sources. Um, and this is all uh, grant money. So this is not like, you know, we still own 100% of the company, which is kind of weird. Um, and I, I feel like we've been successful because we've raised more in revenue just by selling our stuff than we've raised in, in grants. So we've kind of like leapfrog over the other ones. And now we just, I'm hoping that we can leave the other number in the dust and kind of take off from there. And so uh, we now have 11 TED Talks. We did one this summer. So um, we've now sold uh, almost you know, 16,000 spiker boxes from that first one we did in, uh, in 20 or 2009. So that's kind of cool. And I think each one, we, we have a spike counter, so we keep track of every kid who has heard a spike for the very first time, because uh, that was really near and dear to my heart and why I switched to become, dedicated my life to become a neuroscientist the first time I heard a spike. Okay, um, and then for me as an academic, I still am a bit of a nerd and like to uh, publish science. And so we've been um, publishing each year, number of papers uh, that are doing actual research. And so, for all the neuroscientists or just generally scientists in the room that are listening, maybe they're in STEM majors, uh, why entrepreneurship for scientists? And these, I just want to end with something like this, because I think what I didn't really expect in those early days is just how rewarding it was to have something that came out of your brain that you made with your hands that someone hands you money for. They said, you know, there's some value in that. I want to. I want to have that thing, right? So that was kind of cool. Um, the other thing that was cool is that I realized at that time, which I was taking a risk by kind of skipping a postdoc and starting a company, I realized what I was doing, I was actually becoming a PI. I, uh, that's a PI is what we call, you know, like professors, like the, when they have a lab, they're a PI. What does that mean? It means they're making the decisions on the experiments they want to run, the grants they're going to write, and the research that's going to be performed in their lab. And so that's, um, I guess looking back, I, I, I wasn't. I was thinking about the company, but I wasn't really thinking about the, the, the how liberating it was to become a scientist. That is, it's like a, it's like a gentleman scientist from the 1800s, right? Like anything I want to work on it. When we've done, you know, uh, publications, and uh, I have a TED talk on plants. Like I would, there's no way at a university I would be able to say, hey, you know, what, I'm going to switch up from this and go into uh, how do plants work, right? Or, or uh, work with electric fish or do a, just weird stuff and you can just switch it around all the time because you're kind of writing your own, uh, you know, your own ideas for, for doing research. Um, I want to say that that in STEM fields, the grad students tend to have really highly specialized and unique talents and those are what uh, you know people who fund entrepreneurs are looking for. They're looking for really kind of unique ideas uh, that can be done um, and with unique skill sets you know people we don't fund ideas we fund uh, you know people but that's that's true and then there's and there's so much funding available there's SBIRs that's the ones that we got those 5.2 million dollars with um, and that comes from the federal government if you can show a need somewhere in society for uh, the product you're going to give you can sometimes get money for that and so uh, the other thing, there's tons of money from from incubators. The, there's you know region-based ones. There's kind of technology-based ones. Like for example, in my field, there's like a there's a, there's a number of neuro neurotech uh, things. People are throwing money at people that with neurotech. I just saw Open BCI got funding for that for a very silly project yesterday. So, but anyway, uh, so I think people are tripping, still tripping over themselves to give you money. Um, 
And again, as you can tell from our stuff, you don't have to start big. You don't have to start with a slide deck asking for $1.8 million. You can just do it by growing. It's, a, it's, an, it's an old, old way of, of starting companies. I think it's not really talked about that much anymore, but you can grow big. Uh, I think MailChimp did that as well. There's a few, there's a handful of stories out there in the tech industry that have done that, but not that much anymore. But um, and then finally, uh, the scientists out there, you can be as academic as you like. You might think that if I'm gonna start a company then I won't be an academic, but that's not true. You can still be an academic. You can still get invited to scientific conferences. I, I present posters, I present talks, and it's, it's a very cool way uh, to interact with your colleagues because now you can you can add, you don't have to wait to get a research grant. If you do that, you can just jump right in and start doing stuff. So. Anyway, that's why I think entrepreneurship is cool uh, for scientists. And so uh, we are, all around the world on all seven continents. And now if you can see it right down here, we're even in Antarctica. Uh, we had a researcher that was down there doing some uh, research on these slugs that are living in this almost one degree Celsius water, but they're still moving around and interacting. So we're looking at the, the neurons there. Uh, and then hopefully, you know, we're talking with NASA and in cases trying to get our stuff into space. And we're working on a new TED talk. We're gonna do some looking at muscle fatigues out in space. And so, uh, with that, I'm going to uh, end this portion of the experiment or this lecture by, by talking about uh, the experiments that we do. And if, if there's anybody out there, maybe, that has uh, some idea that's doing some, some research in their area, uh, I'm not sure if they're all entrepreneurs or maybe there's people who are working in labs that want to democratize what they're doing, um, come talk to us, uh, especially if you know how to do marketing, uh, if you know what Google Analytics does and, and how it works. and what does it eat and that type of stuff. We'd like to talk to you as well. So anyway, uh, so I think I'm gonna end my portion of the talk here uh, and then I'll, I can open up the floor to some questions if you guys have it. Greg, I wanna thank you for your time. That was phenomenal. And we all needed the, um, for, for some of us, the refresher course on um, Neuroscience 101. <laughs> for some in our student audience, they were like, oh yeah, we've got this. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, I, uh, I, I'm just even trying to think where to begin with you. Um, okay. Your your journey has been incredible. Um, you are you are fun to watch uh, and keep an eye on. Um, and it was fun seeing the old pictures. You haven't aged, and Thomas the Brooklyn looks the same. Yeah, <laughs> as well. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, but I, I guess first and foremost, um, why did you stay in Ann Arbor? Uh, you know, like why why keep why keep all of this here? Yeah, that's a good question. Yes, the um, I mean, I'm from the Midwest, right? And I feel like the Midwest is um, is kind of more my speed. Uh, it, it's because in these, I, I've, I've, went, I've been in a number of incubators, and I feel like the people from the coasts, I and mean, that's kind of where the money's going, right? But I feel like those guys, this backyard brains would not have been able to start in Brooklyn or like in the Bay Area because I feel like that mentality is left a long time ago. But here in the Midwest, I mean, like in the in the early days, like when we started, I don't know if you guys remember what happened in 2009. It was like right after the housing market crash and there were kind of a lot of people, a lot of work. And so we, we were working with a lot of uh, mechanical engineers that were kind of either unemployed or underemployed in kind of setting up some of our original molds and stuff we were making and stuff like that. I, I kind of like that kind of that blue collar feeling of our company. You know, we are, and, and I like doing pitch competition. We, 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 we will often win them, but, but we're also, we're almost the, the proletariat amongst the bourgeois, right? So we're like we have these FinTech people and like people doing uh, all this other stuff. And then you come in with a bunch of cockroaches doing some weird stuff. Um, yeah, so I think that's why I, I, I did this. So, so we moved back um, uh, after South America uh, I just decided to move back here. I do have family here, uh, which is near and dear to my heart, but I wouldn't have stayed here if I didn't think uh, we could do that. And we had support. Uh, we had, so the other thing I didn't mention about Michigan is that there are a whole bunch of resources that even my colleagues that I, I chat with, I, I was having a discussion with one of my friends at MIT who has a company. And I was explaining to him about, you know, the, uh, the workshop that the SBDC is doing here in Michigan uh, and then we have what, uh, the company called the BBC. Uh, they do, it's not the, the broadcasting system, but it's a, um, I don't even know what it stands for, business, does anyone know? Anyway, uh, but they will help you uh, look over your grants and they will do extremely good edits on your grants and tell you, oh, no, no, you don't wanna write that. This is, what, this is what they're looking for, that type of stuff. And so in the beginning, 
when we were especially being very strange and and trying to write you know large grants for a very strange project um they kind of helped us rein us in a little bit so we didn't sound too weird so we had like a little bit more normal uh and so i think you get a lot of support and so then and after that i've been working with spark uh, the Arbor spark downtown and i still continue to meet with them uh in fact we're in a, a another engagement with them right now uh, looking at this marketing problem that we have and so uh yeah so i think there are there are a ton of resources here i think uh, ann arbor has got a vibrant community of of entrepreneurs i like the ann arbor you know new tech meetups stuff like that and, uh, and so i think there's um the downside is there's a lot of turnover uh, a lot of like a lot of the really good people we had um tend to move away because like if you're it seems to be kind of like a, a spot where uh talent kind of comes and maybe they do some a few years here and maybe they're in grad school or their their wife is uh you know in grad school or something like that and so we've had that a number of times we had we had a lot of good talent that kind of left and moved to the to the coast so uh there, there is a bit of a downside to that as well but you know, i think for us seemed to fit our, our our mentality no that's great and i've heard it loud and clear i hope there's over 300 people on this call right now 321 um, I hope the students are hearing you say you need marketing help and you need someone who knows how to do Google Analytics because um, the student resource pool is phenomenal and it's phenomenal for them to gain that that real world experience. Um, you are inspiring, though, as someone coming from academia uh, in terms of, you know, having your ideas become something. Um, I guess you also touched on um, entrepreneurship's a great segue, right, um, from academia. How do you see that trend having changed since you have been here, right? Um, do you think, for example, the university is embracing it? And what do you think they need to do? Oh, my uh, God, yeah. So the, you know, so <laughs> I never tell the story, um, but when we did that poster uh, that was talking about this product. And when we started the idea of launching the company with CFE, it, I was shunned. I mean, it was, it was, it was deemed almost like, uh, you know, heresy to not, you know, try to get into my, uh, I had a, I had a PI in central campus who shall remain nameless uh, and <laughs> harass me every day. If he found something on the printer that was like, like a schematic from me. What are you doing using my research? He was just really upset that I was going into, I was, I was toying with the idea that something wasn't like, I wasn't going to join his colleague's lab at Harvard and do a postdoc and then go move to Stanford and do another postdoc and then start in a small university and then get to a larger university. And I just do play the game that you play in academia, right? And so uh, it was completely, yeah. And I remember, um, uh, so we had, um, I, I don't take myself too seriously, and I think that's it's uh, for scientists they could learn that a little bit. Because I think they, uh, especially in that department, I, we, I remember just being harassed all the time about various things that we were doing uh, around this theme. You know, like, like doing satirical posters that were kind of making fun of ourselves and our science, our, sci our fellow scientists, because you know satire is a good way to sort of talk, have discussions, stuff like that. So. Yeah, I think the entire uh, attitude towards entrepreneurship has changed. And, and I keep telling people, like, did anyone listen? Like, you guys are extremely lucky. Man. I feel like, you know, 10 years ago, uh, I think the CFE had just started. I think that, how long, what was the anniversary? Like 10, 10, 12, 11 years, yeah. 12 years. Yeah, so right, that's right when we started in the company. So the, um, and so it was, it was especially in central campus where I was in the, uh, in, in the neuroscience. I think engineering is a little bit more cool about that because a lot of professors have companies and stuff like that. But in, where I was in Central Campus in the biopsych department, no one has companies. There's no, it's no, there's no company in biopsych, right? So that was just considered like uh, the worst thing you could possibly do. But I think that attitude is changing. I think uh, the the more that the that you know the the program has gotten a lot mature about that, they're doing better at marketing within the university to let them know that this is now a a viable uh, pathway for for anyone to go through that wants to go through it, and that you can. You can so yeah, it's it's changed basically, uh, you know, 180 degrees from where it used to be. And I'll I'll share. We see that too, especially under the the pandemic. I think a lot of students are working on their side hustle now more than ever. So um, th that's fun for us to see. Um, 
if, if there can be any fun coming out of a pandemic, right? But um, yeah, it's- Yeah, sure. Uh, can I just pick through some of these questions or answers? Yeah, I was just gonna say that. Um, yeah, so uh, someone, someone's asking about the, um, the incubator in Chile. That's still going on mm -hmm. today. Uh, so that's Startup Chile. Uh, I think they're on, I, I guess something ridiculous. They're on round 48 or something like that. So I think they do three rounds a year, or maybe it's even more than that. But the, um, uh, but the yeah, so the, so the idea is that you, it's uh, like, a, like any other, it's a very, it's not a lot of work. At least I, I haven't looked at the application in a while. It's been a number of years since I've applied, but it was uh, you submit something and they farm it out to uh, a team of business people. Uh, and then you have an interview and then you get selected. And I tell you, that was a lot of fun. Um, obviously, you know, being in uh, a large incubator in South America um, with people from all around the world that are roughly your age with roughly the same kind of enthusiasm for what they're doing. And so you, you and so I think I've made some lifelong friends there, um, but it also allowed us uh, a lot of consulting help, a bit like the CFB, they had people come in and tell you, oh, no, no, you don't want to do it this way. And so like, uh, again, you, be, be careful of the advice you get. Like everyone has, I mean, it, it probably all makes sense from where they're coming from, but maybe not always for you. Um, that's one of the things I found, especially down there, because when you're mixed in with uh, like, you know, people that are building like ideas for like, automotive industry, and so they, like everybody, like, every industry is different, right? So I think uh, there's certain things that are kind of universal across businesses, but there's certain things that don't quite work. So if you don't, if you feel like it's not right in your gut, it's okay, I think, to to not accept every piece of advice that you get, right? Absolutely. Uh, and I have just just like, let me see if I can read. I know that. you can see like me now. Yeah, I'm seeing here. Uh, is it mostly for monitoring motor control? I imagine that a scalar, ooh, scalar, uh, time signal is enough information to monitor the brain itself. If you need 2D or 3D is a time signal. Um, so it turns out that the, yeah, so uh, time is linear, right? So we, <laughs> there is a one dimensional time. And the question is, how many, how many axes can you put on top of it? How many degrees of freedom can you get? So um, and so what we are showing, and if you watch some of our TED talks, I keep, I try to hammer this home is that is, uh, there's a lot of like dumb money in my opinion, being, being spent on, you know, these, these EEG headsets that you can put on and control things with your thoughts alone. Right? And it sounds really sexy and really, uh, uh, like, and, and, and you can say, oh, okay, man, this is just a prototype, but wait, just wait, you know, five more years is going to be so much better that, but I think the reality is if you look at that spike, at that neuron that was firing, um, and you keep moving further and further away, every step you get away from that, you start losing information. If you know the second law of thermodynamics is that information basically goes away, right? So you, as you get further and further away, uh, you start to get to more disorder, and then you get to the outside of your brain, there's almost no information. There's some information, and so that's what we, we do some experiments that show that. <laughs> But I don't think that we'll ever be able to resolve uh, some things. And so what can you do instead of that is that you have to put things inside the brain, right? And that's what uh, Elon Musk is working on right now. And I like the fact that Elon is doing that because I think that is an engineering problem. That can be solved. That can be solved by, you know, Elon Musk. It can be solved by, I think it might be solved better. It's, it, I think companies are better at engineering problems than universities are. And so I think that is an engineering problem. So he's doing some really cool ideas to get around blood vessels so you don't get the disruption, you don't get the glial scarring. And so uh, that could be the solution for that. But I think uh, for our intensive purposes, the what we found is that instead of drilling into the head, I didn't really discuss this too much, but um, there's a biohack. And that is that you, you already have a part of the brain that is designed to control things, right? And that's your motor cortex. You can move your arms around all you want. I can do this because I've got a section of my brain right here that is designed to control things, right? And so, um, and so that's where the people target. So when you put things in the brain to control things, you're looking there. Or maybe other people, Ted Berger's looking at hippocampus to be able to access memories and control memories. Um, but the main idea is that you can can do it with the with the with cortical control, right? And so. So the hack that we're doing is we're just waiting one synapse away as it goes down to your spinal cord, out to your muscle. We can also record from that same neuron there without putting wires in there. So that's why I'm sticking it on my, my muscles here. And so I'm recording the output of my brain there. And what's cool about that 
is that you can have you can have multiple muscles, right? So if I put a whole bunch of, of electrodes around here, now that I can control each individual finger. And I don't know if you can see behind me a prototype of a hand that can that can do just that. So by by doing it, so we can look at using machine learning to figure out how you move your hand and then decode what those muscle activities look like. Those muscle activities are basically a one-to-one -one mapping to what's going on in the motor cortex. And so there's a very easy way to get access to that. And then what um, it's actually done in, in clinical uh, work as well. They'll take a muscle from someone who's paralyzed, they'll splay it apart, put electrodes on there, and then the person can stop thinking about just moving that muscle and they start thinking about moving a cursor on the screen that's called the cursor cortex. That you can use the plasticity of the brain uh, to be able to start to control things, but but uh, yeah, there is only one de one degree of freedom in time, but there are multiple degrees of freedom in the number of electrodes you can have, and then also in the number of frequencies. So in the so when the brain oscillates, it can oscillate both slowly and quickly at the same time. So you can use those as control signals. There's different ways that you can do it, but I'm telling you though, I, if anyone's having investment in any of these uh, EEG startups. Uh, you're not going to do it. <laughs> that's, that's my opinion. Unless we have a breakthrough in uh, maybe in deep learning, you can recover some of the, but I, I think we need a new physics, a new science to be able to do things like that. Okay. Yeah, you, you're uh, not going to get to all of these. And my students who are in discussion section, let's table yours for, because we're going to get Greg with us in about 20 minutes. So I'm, we're going to table those questions. Um, We've got one minute left, Greg. How All right, one minute. Let, let, me, let me just touch it. So this, someone asked a very important question, and, and, and I, I don't do a good job of, especially in these short talks, talking about it. So they asked about the ethics, the ethical concerns about what we do. And so that's very important to us. And so, in fact, the longest chapter we have in our MH, MIT press book is about the ethics of doing uh, experimentation, right? And so what we talk about there, and I'll sum it up in less than a minute, is you have to look at the the pros and cons, the, you know, the cost and benefit of any experiment you do. And if you look at, I just already mentioned earlier that, you know, 20% of the world's a neurological disorder, there's no cures for those. That's a heavy cost, right, to society. But what's the cost of the animal? Uh, so when we do things to the animal, we measure everything very carefully. We publish a number of peer-reviewed papers showing that there seems to be very little cost. If we cut a leg off, the leg regrows. If we put the backpack, the antennas regrow. All this stuff kind of happens. Uh, and so we seem like the cost of the the animal is low, but the benefit to society is really high. So we feel that that is ethical. And so that's something that uh, it should relate. So if I was doing a real live animal experiment, I would always make sure to talk about that, but I should always talk about that no matter what. So we are very, very careful about that. We still have PETA that attacks us every day, but that's all right. I mean, I think someone needs to talk about uh, the ethical use of animals within science, and I guess that's, that's going to be good. Yeah, I th and thank you for touching on that because as I'm going up and down the questions, I'm like, we, we can't skirt that one either. So um, thank you, but we are at time. Greg, I, I will share. Um, students can go to backyardbrains.com. That's correct. You can find okay. us in Backyard Brains. We've got a couple students uh, asking how do we get Every once in a while we tweet, but I mean, that's another, we need a social media version as well, so. <laughs> okay, so we'll direct All everyone right. there who wants to get a hold right. of you. Greg, thank cool. you so much. Thanks, guys.